Good evening, and welcome to Real Talk's two-part race and justice series titled, Is Justice Truly Blind? Examining the, co the Courts for Racial Equity from Arraignment through Reentry. Tonight in part one, we'll be joined by a panel of judicial experts to break down the complicated stages of the criminal justice process and learn what can be done about inherent inequities and disparate outcomes for defendants of color and who are in poverty. I'm M.L. Schultze, your moderator for this evening. Over my 40 years as a print and public broadcast journalist, I've been lucky to cover most aspects of our shared life in Northeast Ohio, including education, local government and politics, the environment and health. But no issue has intrigued me more than our justice system and the people, rules and actions that shape that system and those whose lives are shaped for better and often for worse by it. So I was happy and challenged when the league asked that I moderate our first session. Before we move on, we want to thank our incredible program partners and contributors who help bring this and other crucial issues to life. Real Talk is a diversity, equity, and inclusion program that addresses life-threatening inequities and disparities in criminal justice, education, public health, housing, and democracy. It's hosted by four leagues of women voters in Northeast Ohio, Akron, Hudson, Greater Cleveland, and Kent, in strong partnership with the Akron NAACP, the Freedom Block, WKSU, and WCPN IdeaStream. This evening's session focuses on dissecting and understanding the system from arraignment through sentencing, through which nearly one third of America's adult working age population now has a criminal record. We'll be sharing the perspectives of judges, prosecutors and public defenders and other witnesses to and participants in the system. And we'll leave plenty of time for questions and answers, including most importantly, yours. So feel free to drop any questions for the panel in the chat and Q&A box on your screen. We're beginning our discussion with a quick overview of how our criminal justice system began and evolved with a perspective coming from Brant Lee, the Assistant Dean of Diversity and Social Justice Initiatives at the University of Akron School of Law. Professor Lee chairs Akron's Civil Rights Commission and his courses include social justice lawyering, race and complex systems, civil liberties, and law and theology. A Harvard Law School graduate, Professor Lee was a private practice attorney, White House Deputy Staff Secretary and Special Assistant to the President, and a counsel to the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee. Professor Lee, please get us started. Well, thank you so much for including and inviting me to this important conversation. Um, I, I want to start by observing that uh, most people, and by that I actually I really mean most non-Black people, right, might see the criminal justice system at face value and only in the present, right? Um, you know, police officers protect us from criminals. The criminal justice system is there to determine who's guilty, to punish the ones who are, uh, in order to keep us all safe from criminals. And we don't have much of a sense of the history. I mean, presumably, right, police practices, court practices have evolved over the years, like everything else, but we assume that that has basically served the same function, right, all along. And the history doesn't seem particularly relevant to discussions about whether today, right, in a particular instance, the system was unfair, maybe to a particular individual. We're looking for evidence about what went wrong in each individual case. And we might not have had any personal ex bad experience sort of among ourselves or our loved ones to tell us any different, right? But a, like a lot of things, different people have different perspectives on that. And, and it falls along racial lines. So I'm gonna focus on some of the history, but I also wanna close with a little bit about the role of ideology and implicit bias in, in, in setting up this whole system. I'm gonna go all the way back in one state. So we're talking here about the 
Ooh, that was a little blip. Uh, well, let me just continue. Um, no person held in service or labor in one state escaping into another state, right? So now we're talking about fugitive criminals. Right after that, we're talking about fugitive slaves, right? And the sentence continues, none of those people shall be discharged from service or labor. So that means they can't be freed, right? If they're even if they're in a freed state, but shall be delivered up on claim of the person to whom such service or labor is due. So the status of the slave owner is enshrined in the constitution, right? They are to be returned to the enslaver. That's the fugitive slave clause. And right from the beginning, I just want to point out, right? Criminality and blackness are associated with each other, right? States are to return fleeing criminals and fleeing slaves back to the states from which they came. And the idea of controlling black people is right there, right, in the Constitution. So then when Lincoln signs the Emancipation Proclamation, and slavers tried to keep that news from the people that they had enslaved. And I want you to notice. Now we're in a situation where people are trying by force and deception to control black people when it was no longer legal to do so, right? They had been freed. This is an extra legal means of control. And that's a pattern that continues. And you may remember that during reconstruction, right? After the civil war, federal troops in the South kept the peace and black people owned property. They started businesses, they ran for offices, they got elected. There were black senators from the South during reconstruction, right? They formed political alliances with poor white people and they thrived. And when the federal troops pulled out, it's hard to overstate the amount of violence that was involved in bringing black people back under control. And sometimes it was white mobs and white plantation owners, and sometimes it was police officers and the criminal justice system. And as Jim Crow got established, the black codes were adopted, the system was set up so that it was the criminal justice system that was deployed, right? They created new crimes of vagrancy and loitering um, leading to the mass arrest and incarceration of black people who were then like rented out back to the plantation owners as convict labor. So criminalization was the solution to a free black population. And you know, black people still persevered, they still strove, they still rose. And it was that perceived impertinence that led us to the time of of the era of lynchings, right? And the kind of a reign of terror. There were over 4,000 lynchings between 1880 and 1945, many of them premised on an accusation of a crime, right? And with complicity and active participation of law enforcement. Um, and so I'm gonna like speed through this, right? We're moving forward in time. Um, in the 1950s in neighborhoods all over the country when black families were bought homes in white neighborhoods, and white mobs gathered outside and threw rocks and burned crosses, right? Law enforcement officers were there, generally standing by and doing nothing and arresting no one, right? This is not the South. This is suburbs outside of Chicago, outside of Philadelphia, outside of San Francisco, right? And then when Martin Luther King marched, right? You've seen the footage of what happened in Selma and Birmingham. And did you ever wonder what happened to Bull Connor, the, the, the head of the police force, right? The year after the marches in 1963, the next year he was elected president of the Alabama Public Services Commission. And he was reelected and held office until 1972. I have a lot more anecdotes, but I'd like to skip ahead. Uh, in, in the Brian Stevenson movie, Just Mercy, right? That tells the story of the man who was unjustly on death, death row, who was first arrested by a sheriff in 1987. The false murder conviction was defended by that sheriff. That sheriff was continually reelected until 2018, right? So I wanna first, I wanna affirm that, you know, police departments and prosecutors and judges today have changed. But I would just wanna to point out that it's not hard to see why somebody whose family or community has experienced pieces of all of this, has heard the stories passed down, right? The family lore includes parts of this that person might feel differently, right? And instead of presuming change, you might wanna know, well, actually, when did that happen, right? And what exactly changed, right? The last two things I wanna say, ideology is a piece of this, right? We shifted sometime in the 1990s towards a really tough on crime, low on rehabilitation sort of theory about how the criminal justice works. That is a big piece of this. And secondly, finally, about implicit bias. Implicit biases or implicit associations, they're just mental connections, right? I say peanut butter, you say, I bet a fair number of you thought jelly, right? That's just because they go together. So I say black man and you say 
You know, well, the word athlete or poor or thug might have occurred to you more quickly than, say, engineer or elegant or, or victim, right? And let me just give you one example about, because, you know, implicit bias can affect teachers, police, you know, prosecutors, juries, judges, everybody along the, the way. I'm just going to give you one example about how unconscious this is, right? They did a study with jurors. And they showed them a picture of a suspect wearing a ski mask, but you could see his bare arm. And they manipulated the photo so that the skin could be darker or lighter. And they showed them all this other evidence that was designed to present sort of an ambiguous situation. And they were asked to give at the case a score on the scale of 1 to 100 with 100 being definitely guilty. And it will surprise you not at all that jurors who saw the dark skin picture gave a score 10 points higher on average, right? And, but here's the thing, when asked, the race of the suspect, those jurors could not remember. They did not even know or remember what race, uh, you know, what the race of the, of the suspect was. But regardless of whether they were, any of them were consciously racist, right? You still had the result that the fictional character with darker skin was 10 points more guilty. So those are some ideas, some history that I want you to sort of keep in mind as you hear the panel discuss right, the problem of racial inequality in our criminal justice system. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lee. The process as it's been outlined, and as you'll see from the following slides, is anything but simple. Please don't panic as we try to keep you up to speed through the, of how the process works. Uh, we will be sending out these slides and a lot of other information to everybody who's a participant tonight. Uh, but as much as anything, we think these slides make the point that a complex system, and Professor Lee, you know complex systems and race, um, is, is the very definition of the courts. In Ohio alone, we have hundreds of courts that deal with everything from fines to death sentences. And even cases that on their face are not criminal, such as child support, can have long-term repercussions. In the past two decades, some of these courts have developed special dockets, such as veterans and drug courts, but the overall structure of the courts has remained much the same for the last 100 years. As complex as the system itself seems with all of the county level and municipal level and mayor's courts up to the US Supreme Court, it may pale next, next to this next slide. The path of someone facing criminal justice and the path that they'll be following from beginning to end and actually beyond. In general terms, felonies go to common pleas courts, misdemeanors go to municipal courts. But there's no simple flowchart after that. And some of the key decisions that are made early in the process, from the charging choices of police officers to the decisions to plead guilty or no contest, can largely dictate the outcomes of every other step along the way. All of this has a huge impact. The impact of these cases is massive throughout our society, especially for people of color. Nationally, the U.S. has 5% of the world's population, yet a quarter of its prison population. And Ohio has one of the highest prisoner counts in the country. Nearly half of the people imprisoned here are Black, more than three times the percentage of Ohio's population that is African American. Black people are much more likely to be charged with felonies, remain in jail before trial, and be imprisoned after conviction. So what we've done is we've turned to this panel to help us demystify the process and to understand the impact of developments ranging from mandatory sentencing to bail reform on the courts as they are today. Joining us are retired Cleveland Municipal Judge Ronald Aldrin, Summit County Common Community Outreach Prosecutor Tanya Niemer, Cuyahoga County Chief Public Defender Cullen Sweeney, Franklin County Common Pleas Administrative Judge Stephen McIntosh, and Akron Municipal Judge David Hamilton. We also want to thank Cuyahoga County Common Pleas Judge Cassandra Collier-Williams, who was an early planner for this project, but is unable to attend. Together, this panel tonight will bring us a range of experience, perspectives, and roles with the courts, and with their own evolution within the courts. 
They'll outline processes, philosophies, practices, and alternatives, as well as how the courts have adapted to everything from bail to plea bargains to the racial inequities revealed by both the statistics and the human stories of those who go through the system. Again, a reminder, we will have a Q&A after the presentations and we welcome your input via the chat and Q&A functions on Zoom. You can put your questions in there at any time. We'll begin with Judge Adrian, who will walk us through the first steps for many in the criminal courts, arraignment and bail. A lifelong resident of Northeast Ohio, the judge was a prosecutor, private attorney, and senior staff member to the U.S. House Select Committee on Assassinations before being elected to six consecutive terms, that's 36 years, to the Cleveland Municipal Court bench. He was presiding judge of the court until his retirement in 2018 and is a recipient of the Freedom Fund Award from the Cleveland branch of the NAACP and the Ohio State Bar Association's Ohio Bar Medal and the Thomas J. Moyer Award for Judicial Excellence. Welcome, Judge. Thank you, and uh, I appreciate it. Uh, I think my, my job to this evening is to really just give everybody a quick thumbnail sketch of uh, the entry level into the criminal justice system. Frequently, people talk about uh, those who get arrested and charged ending up in the belly of the beast. But what they don't talk about is the mouth of the beast and how folks end up getting caught up in the first instance. In, in frequent uh, matters, uh, people find themselves are caught into uh, the criminal justice system through minuscule kinds of matters. Uh, once you get yourself a number of any sort type or description, uh, it just uh, almost guarantees that there is a high probability that you're going to get another number and another number and another number. Uh, in communities of color, uh, there are areas that are designated, unfortunately, and quite frequently as quote unquote, high crime areas. And that's been going on for many years, maybe 40, 50, or 60 years that those kinds of designations have taken place. The interesting thing about it is that at one point in time, there, there was uh, a concern within Black communities about the amount of crime and request for increased enforcement. In the 1980s uh, and in the early 90s, we began the war on drugs, and I put that in quotes, um, because those were political decisions that were made. Uh, initially, they were made by uh, people who were in the Republican Party uh, as a, a way to uh, garner new uh, people to their uh, point of view, but ultimately, uh, that point of view was also adopted by the Democratic Party and both parties uh, tried to one up each other in order to make it harder and harder uh, for folks who did get caught up in the criminal justice system to find a way out. It also was racialized uh, because the areas where individuals were caught up, these open air markets, uh, apparently were places where individuals uh, could easily be found, uh, rounded up and put in jail. Once an individual goes into the system by way of arrest, there is a process by which they're handled. Uh, there are two things that happen initially. There's an initial appearance, and there is an arraignment. Uh, an, an initial appearance is usually uh, where a court makes a decision about bail as to whether or not a person should uh, be released pending the outcome of their case. Whereas arraignment is the point in time when the individual 
uh, makes an answer to the charge that's been brought against them, either not guilty, guilty, or sometimes no contest, depending on whether or not we're talking about felonies or misdemeanors. Uh, and has the judge either assigned to their case if it is a misdemeanor, or has the matter sent further into the system, into the grand jury system where they once again uh, face the possibility of having some individual make a determination as to whether or not there is at least the minimal amount of information uh, about the crime to suggest A, that a crime took place and B, that they're the ones who uh, committed the crime. What's really telling these days and has been for a long time is how uh, that system plays out. Beginning again in the 70s and the 80s and more so in the 90s, we have seen the growth of the use of monetary bail as a means of obtaining release from jail. Uh, before the 70s, monetary bail was not really used that frequently. The Constitution requires that all people be presumed to be innocent until such time as they are uh, proven to be guilty. And as a result, uh, that means that they should be able to be at liberty until such time as it's proven that they should be incarcerated. That's not the way that it works when monetary bond comes into play. What monetary bond has effectively done over a period of time is uh, criminalize poverty because the majority of people who are kept in jail are there because of the fact that they are unable to make the bond, not because they're guilty of the offense that's been charged. As a matter of fact, of the some 720,000 Americans on any given day who were uh, incarcerated, more than half of those individuals are being held pre-trial. Some studies that have been done in uh, places like New York have found that individuals are held in jail for prolonged periods of time because of their inability to post even a $500 bail. That being the case, uh, it means that individuals find themselves uh, up with a, a, a uh, what's it, a Faustian choice to make. Either stay in jail because they can't make bail or enter a plea and get a criminal record, but get out of jail and get back to your lives. You end up with people making that second choice and as a result, experiencing a whole series of cumulative disadvantages that come with having done that. That set of cumulative damages may mean the loss of a job. It may mean uh, the loss of family connections. It may mean health considerations, all kinds of things that happen because of the fact that um, the uh, system basically has picked people up, chewed them up, and spit them back out. It's highly likely that an individual who is found uh, to be in jail is going to be in a spot where uh, they're not going to be able to uh, advantage themselves because they were in jail instead of being out. I have a quick video that I want to show. I'm going to try to share my screen because I think it tells the story better than I can. We had two primary findings. First, we just really confirmed decades of research that shows that that release and detention decision impacts the likelihood a person will be incarcerated. In this particular study, again, when controlling for all relevant factors, detained defendants were over four times more likely to be sentenced to jail 
and over three times more likely to be sentenced to prison than similarly situated defendants who were able to secure their release pretrial. The second finding also confirmed, again, decades of research that shows that sentences to incarceration are longer for defendants who aren't able to secure their release pretrial, two to three times longer to jail and prison respectively. But interestingly, with this study, there was a unique component, which is we looked at the length of period of pretrial incarceration for defendants who were released. So here, you know, release or detention is not an all or nothing proposition, right? It, sometimes it takes time for a defendant to be released. It can take days, it can take weeks, sometimes it can take months. So with this study, what we did was we looked at for people who were released, did it matter how long it took them to secure their release? And the answer was a resounding yes. In fact, this study found that for low risk defendants and moderate risk defendants, but really primarily low risk defendants, pretrial incarceration for even just a few days increased the likelihood that the defendants would come back into the criminal justice system, both pretrial and post disposition, 50% higher. In fact, as the length of pretrial detention increases up to about the first 30 days, at that point, the damage is done. Recidivism rates for low and moderate risk defendants also increase significantly. The bottom line is that detaining low and moderate risk defendants increases crime. Unfortunately, the majority of people who experience that problem happen to be people who live in minority communities. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. You have led beautifully into the next member of our panel and her topic, which is charging and plea bargains. Uh, you mentioned that many people make that decision at the point at which they cannot, they cannot make bail and their choices are limited. Tanya Niemer says she grew up in a huge Lebanese family and that spurred her desire to be a problem solver. And this is, as you just noted, a big problem. In her private practice and nonprofit days, Ms. Niemer represented immigrants in federal courts through the Catholic, Cleveland Catholic Charities and as managing attorney for the International Institute of Akron. She was an Akron Municipal Court Magistrate and is now Community Outreach Prosecutor for Summit County Prosecutor Sherry Bevan Walsh. She's a recipient of the Ohio Bar Association's Nettie Kernese Lutz Award, named after the first woman licensed to practice law in Ohio. Ms. Niemer. Thank you very much. Um, okay, we're gonna go to the next slide. And I'm gonna start by just explaining how the prosecutor's office gets a case. And a lot of what I'm gonna talk about are procedures um, that I want everybody to think about um, because this is a conversation that we're gonna have about what can we do to make these procedures better and more equitable? So when we get a case, it, it happens when local law enforcement arrest somebody and issue a summons or a citation for a felony offense. At the Summit County Prosecutor's Office, we work with felony offenses. Um, with more serious crimes there may, um, or crimes that involve agencies, um, we may be, get the crime by secret ind indictment. So that case may come into our docket that way. Um, what I want you all to remember is that um, we are not the police and we are not the sheriff. We are two separate distinct offices from um, that law enforcement. And so when we get a case, we get it from them. And that's when we start our prosecution. And so this is what we do. Once that case, next slide, please. Once we get that case, our job is to present it to the grand jury. <clears throat> and the grand jury hears all felony cases in Summit County. Um, you know, in the past year, they've, they've heard approximately 4,400 cases, which is a lot of cases. And, and the grand jury is comprised of citizens of uh, residents of Summit County. So it's thanks to you all, um, the residents who, who make this possible. And what, what their job is, is to determine if a case has enough probable cause to move forward in the system, to move on to arraignments and into the process. Um, they, the grand jury is, is in essence the gatekeeper of, of these dockets and they are the ones who look at these cases 
um, with a with a third party eye. They are not the police. They are not the prosecutor. Um, they are you. They are citizens who um, who volunteer their time to sit on our grand jury, and um, they provide that first outside review. Um, and so they can decide that this case should move forward, or they may decide that it does not move forward. Either way, that's not up to us. A lot of times, um, you'll see in the paper, you know, they'll say the prosecutor um, indicted X person. Um, but that's not really the case. It's the grand jury that indicts an individual. Um, they vote in secrecy. The prosecutor must leave the room when they're voting. Um, and we have to have a minimum of seven out of the nine jurors who vote to indict someone to, to bring them into the system. Next slide, please. Okay, yes. So what I wanted to share with you were some stats because while I told you that you know, our job is to, to give these cases to the grand jury, let them be the gatekeepers and decide what should go forward. It still doesn't mean that once we get a case from a police department um, or the sheriff's office that we are just going to um, kick it to the grand jury. There are some times where there, we, we screen these cases. So if we see that there's a case that doesn't have sufficient evidence to fall under the grounds of a felony, um, we will, you know, either remand it to the municipal court for a misdemeanor. Um, we've dismissed cases like that. Um, so I put up some stats from our 2019. And I picked 2019 because that's like our last real year, you know, 20 and 21, our cases um, were significantly reduced. Um, so I thought that 2019 would be a good indication of what will be normal. And I'm guessing what we're going to start seeing again in 2022. So you'll see these numbers and I'm not going to review all of them, but I'm going to tell you, you'll see the reasons why um, we reject a case or when we're screening it. Sometimes, you know, we'll see a case and it just doesn't meet the standards or we need more information. Um, and sometimes the grand jury will say, no, this is not um, this doesn't meet the, the standard for a felony. And so um, we're going to no bill it. That's what they call it. They no bill it. So they will not let it move forward into the system. Um, I wanted to note that in 2019, we had 4,667 cases Those were present, that were presented to our office that we screened and or presented to the grand jury. Um, 3,390 cases were indicted and fully prosecuted which means that 27.3% of our cases were screened out or dismissed um, by, by us or the grand jury. And I thought that that was interesting to note because as I said, it doesn't mean that once a police officer has a case and they give it to us, it doesn't mean it automatically goes to the grand jury. There are some cases that um, we just can't present because of the information that was provided. Next slide. So, Judge Adrian talked about arraignments, um, and I want to move on into um, pretrial. So after a grand jury gets a case and they decide um, that this needs to move into the system, that case moves into arraignment, and that is when a judge will de determine if a bond is set or not. Um, what happens after that, once a bond is set, and, and Judge Adrian did a really good job of going through that and the inequities that happen in that, um, what happens if somebody is still in the system, they're going to go to a pretrial um, with an assigned judge. So the court will assign a judge to that case. And then what happens is after that, once a pretrial is set, discovery gets um, exchanged between the plaintiff and the, and the prosecutor, excuse me, the prosecutor and the defendant. Just by discovery, I mean all the information on the, ca on the case. We have um, web, you know, our, our, our cameras, any of our um, video recordings, um, documents, paperwork, any evidence that we have, um, we submit and we must submit to the defense and vice versa. And that time, that discovery is exactly what it is. It's, it's the time for the attorneys to discover what this case is about, um, to know what the defenses are, to know what, um, what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses. And then at that point, once both parties have reviewed the discovery, they can then go on to the negotiation process. And during that process, there are a few things that become options um, for negotiations. And that goes into diversion, um, another program that's called intervention in lieu of conviction, which is similar to diversion. Um, I will use the abbreviation IILC, although I'm not a big fan of um, 
abbreviations. And then we also have specialty courts. And then there's also the option of prison and probation. And you know, the concern for the prosecutor's office is to make sure that our community is safe. So when there are cases that um, an individual um, would be eligible for diversion in IALC in the specialty courts, uh, we are more, more than happy to put individuals into that program. Um, we want to see that rehabilitation. We want to see our community move forward in that way. But there are also situations where you have repeat offenders and serious crimes that are occurring that we have to keep protecting our community. And sometimes prison is the option. So I, I wanted you to take a look at our negotiations. And that's basically what we have in our pocket to work with, to work with our defense attorneys and our defendants and our court um, to come to a solution. Next slide, please. So um, the, the, our office is in charge of diversion. It's the only program in this negotiation that I've talked about uh, where we have some control over um, over whether or not this can happen. And that is statutorily um, given to us. And it's an option. Not all prosecutor's offices uh, are required to have a diversion program. Um, Sherry Bevan Walsh, our county prosecutor, has decided to do that. And she's been doing that for 20 years. And this program, like I said, is statutorily run. So we have to comply with, um, with the statute. But uh, these are the, the parameters of how an individual qualifies for diversion. Again, we're looking at low level felonies, you know, felony of the fourth degree, felony of the fifth degree. We also are looking at nonviolent crimes. You know, as I said before, when we have violent offenders, that is something we take very seriously. And when it comes to negotiations, it becomes a lot more difficult to negotiate something like a diversion because you wouldn't qualify for that because of the seriousness of your crime. Our diversion program does not um, relate to any drug related crimes. And you'll see why, because there's another program that works with, that's the IILC that works with drug related crimes. And then the other requirement for our diversion program is that that individual had no fi uh, felony convictions previously. Next slide, please. So, we are now looking at our screening of our diversionary programs. And I gave the 2020 numbers on this one. This kind of gives you the stats of um, how many cases were referred to us. So we talked about having 4,000 cases uh, before. We had 44 people referred from the, from the prosecutor's office, defense attorneys. Everybody works together to determine if they, the defendant is eligible for diversion. So from between the judge, the prosecutor, and the defendant, um, we, we looked at whether or not this person was eligible and 44 people were referred by the court and then only 27 were accepted. Um, again, like I said, it's statutorily governed. Um, we do look at, you know, options and ways to get somebody approved for diversion, but they have to meet that criteria. Again, we don't want the serious offenders in this program because what happens if they they get accepted and they complete the requirements. And those requirements are to do you know, some sort of program um, relating to the crime that they, they were charged with. Um, if they complete this, then their case is dismissed. It's sealed from the record in, in that sense. So they, it's as though they never had the case. So it's, it's really um, something that you can earn and it's really uh, great for your record because you would no longer have one if you do comply with the requirements for di di diversion. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, the other program is um, intervention in lieu of conviction. And it is exactly like diversion in the sense you enter a guilty plea. If you complete the program and all of um, what is required of you, then your case can be um, sealed. So that goes to individuals who have drug, alcohol, or mental illness. And again, if they have low level felonies and um, no prior felony offense of violence. So you'll see the common theme here, violent offenders are not reaping the benefit of these programs. Next slide, please. The other programs that are available are specialized dockets. They're not as forgiving in terms of, you know, getting your record sealed like IILC and diversion are, but they are really um, focused on treatment. And so the judges are in charge of these programs. 
They are the ones who um, can carry the stats for them. They're the ones who would control what program the individual has to go through in order um, to, to complete. Um, so our court in Summit County has a few specialized dockets. We have Turning Point, um, which is uh, deals with alcohol and, and abuse and, and addiction issues. We have Valor Court for our veterans. We have Domestic Violence Court for individuals. Um, and that, that is high-risk offenders who have, um, who have domestic violence charges against them. And then we also have Hope Court for individuals who have mental health issues. And you're gonna see here, um, some of these courts actually do work with individuals with felony threes conviction. So felony three charges. So that's a little bit higher than what we've worked with for diversion or IILC. And then our next slide. In our office, we look, and I, and I talked a lot about the process of, of what is going on here, because um, I wanted you, you all to see you know, what we have to work with here. And you'll see that in the beginning, we get this case from an officer. So if there are any issues in terms of race and so forth um, and, and equities, you know, we wouldn't see that until it comes to our desk and we wouldn't know what went into that charge originally. Um, <clears throat> and then when we get to the court, you know, we're limited. We're not in charge of the specialized dockets in those sense. But when everybody works together, that's when the solutions can be had. And one person or one entity can't do that in a silo. I will say from our office, we, we've, we've been working with diversity, equity, and inclusion. We actually, over a year ago, had started a committee for the Ambassadors of Equity and Social Justice. Our committee is focused on actually assessing the system just like we're doing here today, um, looking at what the inequities are and seeing what we can do and who we can work with to help address these inequities. We meet um, every other week, there's 12 of us and th these 12 individuals are a very diverse group. Um, they are, they're diverse in their position in our office between support staff, um, uh, victims, um, advocates, attorneys, and they're also diverse in their, their race and ethnicity and gender. Um, and so we really appreciate this committee and they're doing a lot of great work in our office, not just working with the community, but within our office, working on trainings. Um, we do a lot of trainings. We have been for years um, in terms of, of bias, which Professor Lee had talked about. Um, we do these trainings, not just with us, but we also like to train the officers. Cause as I said, when we get that case originally, we don't know what went into that stop. We don't know what the officer was thinking at the time. Um, we have the police report, we have the evidence, but um, we don't know what those internal biases were. So that is something we try to do. Um, we, we, we train the officers and we also train our own staff. Um, we've actually, I was um, privileged by our office to um, be um, sponsored for a training from Cornell University where I went to class. Um, it was remote and I was able to um, earn a, a certificate in diversity and inclusion from Cornell um, after several months of classes. So um, we're working really hard to make sure um, that this is, is an important aspect in our office. Um, through our community outreach, we also work with immigrants in, in, in terms of um, human trafficking visas and U visas. And we're making sure to, because a lot of this starts with our younger students, um, we're making sure to make a presence in our um, our schools, both in the high schools, in the Akron public schools, and um, in our law school, in our Akron law school. So we figured um, that will help, you know, maybe get people excited about working for the prosecutor's office, because it's really hard, you know, sometimes, you know, you're not getting the big bucks here. Um, but I think the mission is important. And I think when people start learning about, um, you know, the public safety that we really care about, um, they, they might meet be more, um, you know, interested in, in working for us. So that's all I have for now. I'm, I'm ready for some questions whenever um, we're done with this panel. I appreciate your time. Hey, thank you, Ms. Niemer. Thank you. Our next panel member, Cullen Sweeney, is going to help us understand the role of race in a system that proclaims itself colorblind. Mr. Sweeney is the chief public defender for the Cuyahoga County Public Defender's Office. He spent four years as an AmeriCorps VISTA volunteer in Alaska, working with Native American Alaskan communities and as executive director of Habitat for Humanity Anchorage. After law school in Wisconsin, he clerked for a federal judge for two years and arrived at the Cuyahoga County Public Defender's Appellate Division in 2005. 
He's argued more than a dozen cases before the Ohio Supreme Court and has litigated habeas corpus petitions in federal court. Mr. Sweeney. Thank you uh, very much. Um, I, I want to start by just saying that I, I remember my first time um, going to uh, the Cuyahoga County Jail uh, as a new public defender and, and being overwhelmed by the number of Black men uh, I saw in, in, in the system. It was just a visceral uh, hit that I got in, in that, that first time. And, and it's something that I think we're, we're all talking about here tonight, but it's something that anyone who has <clears throat> any involvement in the criminal justice system can't help but, but, but see the uh, overrepresentation of minorities, especially Black men. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. This is just a snapshot of our cases for the last two years. Um, and the orange bar you will see is the percent of the county population in Cuyahoga County that Black uh, individuals make up, and it's about 30%. A whole a two thirds of our cases, on the other hand, involve black defendants. So this um, dis disparate uh, representation is something that you see locally as as well as nationally. Go ahead and go to the next slide. And the same is the same is borne out in um, in our municipal cases as well. Um, I think one of the things that you see here, and we're all talking about tonight, that as 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 participants in the legal system, we aspire to be colorblind and to ensure everyone experiences equal justice. But uh, the reality is unfortunately quite different from that. And there's a lot of reasons for it. There's no simple answer or simple answers. We would have fixed the problem by now. Um, but but um, they're sort of pervasive. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. Professor Lee, I think, set it up pretty well. Um, one of the biggest drivers, I think, is personally from my experience is um, implicit bias and the way it plays out in the justice uh, system and the, and, and the way in which so many important consequential decisions are made and are injected with bias by all the participants in, in the system. And one, you can't see the slide very well, but uh, Professor Eberhardt at Stanford um, did an analysis of traffic stops, uh, of officers stopping black motorists and white motorists. And what, what she and her, her team found was a substantial respect bias in the way in which officers spoke from the very beginning of a traffic stop um, to black motorists versus white motorists. They were more respectful with white motorists. They were apologetic. They expressed concern, whereas the approach was very different with black motorists. More often were they ordered out of the car? Was it a confrontational setting? And this is just the very tip of the, you know, your entree into the criminal justice system. Go ahead to the next slide. So one of the things I wanted to emphasize is, well, why is implicit bias so important? Well, it's because there are so many consequential decisions that, that the justice system actors make throughout the process. So I just listed a few here. These are all things that a police officer or officers decide throughout the process. You know, who, what communities do they target for enforcement? Who do they stop? Who do they handcuff? There are a lot of studies that show um, that, that uh, black individuals are far more likely to be handcuffed even when they're not eventually arrested than white individuals. Who do they interrogate? Who do they arrest? Um, all of these things change the nature of what happens, the trajectory of the individual in the criminal justice system. Go ahead. And so what does it mean as a practical matter? It means, and, and there are so many studies uh, out there. I, I was trying to <laughs> come up with, uh, condense these, but, but it's, it's really impossible. That, that black men are stopped more frequently they are searched more frequently, and they are arrested more frequently. And one of the most uh, compelling um, studies was done in, in Ferguson, Missouri, um, where it demonstrated that um, black individuals were twice as likely to be subjected to searches 
but 26% less likely to be in, found with contraband. That same sort of reality was borne out in studies of the stop and frisk program in New York. Recent studies in Chicago actually so, showed that black uh, motorists were four times as likely to be stopped. So this is sort of a, a per, so when we see at the end point more black individuals in the system, we also see at the earlier stages in the proceeding why that's happening, because they're more likely to be targeted throughout the process. Go, go ahead. Now, um, I also just want to highlight the amount, and, and, and the prosecutor just mentioned some of the decisions that they make. They also have a host of discretionary decisions to make. Whether to bring charges, they talked about, she talked about keeping the case as a misdemeanor or possibly dismissing the charges. Um, these are all discretionary decisions, whether to prosecute a child as an adult, whether to seek a high bond and potentially keep the person in during pretrial detention, when to offer a plea bargain, how far to reduce the charges. Um, all these things are, are, so there's an incredible number of consequential decisions that individual prosecutor uh, uh, makes. Go ahead. Um, and Judge um, Adrian touched on this, so I don't wanna to spend too much time on this, but I, I do think it's incredibly important. You cannot understate the impact of pretrial detention. Um, and this is a particularly a disadvantage for, for black defendants because they're incarcerated pretrial at far higher rates than, than their, white, uh, um, their, their white comparison defendants. And, what that means is because pretrial detention increases the likelihood of conviction, increases the likelihood of longer prison sentences, and as Judge Adrian pointed out, by three to four times as long, it means that we see more Black individuals in, in jail and in prison. Go ahead. And this uh, graphic is one that is, I find particularly troubling. Um, if you were born in 2001, one out of every three black men can expect to serve time in prison. Um, whereas one out of sev uh, 17 white men. Um, and I think that kind of just amplifies the disparities. Go ahead. And we already talked about this, but th that disparity plays out both at the local level and in the state of Ohio. Black individuals are incarcerated at a rate of over five times that of white individuals. Um, in the state of Ohio. Go ahead to the next slide. So, um, you know, what are some things that can be done to improve the system? That's one of the things that uh, we were tasked with talking about. I didn't want to be totally negative, but a few things that I think really important that are in the works. One is reforming the bail system. And I'm honored to be on this panel with Judge Adrian. I know it's, it's uh, something that's near and dear to his heart that he started in Cleveland Municipal Court during his time there. But there's a Senate bill and a House bill that's bipartisan that was introduced in this legislative session that will functionally get rid of monetary bail um, for most offenses. And um, it doesn't mean that uh, individuals accused of really serious crimes and who are danger to the community will necessarily get out. It would just require prosecutors to have detention hearings. Um, and, um, one other thing I just want to highlight, I mean, there's a lot of things that can be done to, to improve, but that is the use of things like the Diversion Center that was recently started in Cuyahoga County. Um, and um, Prosecutor Nemer touched on it, which is that treating mental health and substance abuse rather than prosecuting it. Um, I think that's something that would help uh, improve uh, outcomes in addressing the root causes of some of the criminal um, um, realities that we see. And then finally, improving transparency and accountability, I think is important both for police interactions. Um, and this is where I think body cameras have really had a, has, have the potential to have a significant impact if you can really evaluate what the stop looked like. But also on the back end, in terms of there is no statewide database in which we can assess or look at um, individual judges um, or courts um, proclivities for, you know, are they sentencing poor defendants, black defendants, longer sentences, 
And there's uh, a discussion right now uh, with the Ohio Supreme Court to develop a sentencing database that will, number one, be able to identify some of these things, but also will provide a reference point for judges that are trying to figure out what is a fair sentence in the community in which I live, and they can look to uh, comparisons to, to do that. I think some of these things would help improve, um, improve our justice system. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Public Defender Sweeney. Up next, helping us understand more about both the municipal and common pleas courts and some new programs the courts are trying to integrate is Franklin County Judge Stephen Lewis McIntosh, who is Columbus's chief prosecutor, a deputy director with the Ohio Secretary of State and a private attorney before moving on to the common pleas bench in 2007. He's the administrative and drug court judge and chair of the Supreme Court Task Force to examine improvements in Ohio's grand jury system and the Joint Task Force to study the administration of Ohio's death penalty. He's also a member of the Ohio Sentencing Commission. Judge McIntosh. You're still muted. Yes, all right. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Uh, I think I'd, I'd like to start kind of where uh, Professor Lee finished uh, in terms of talking about uh, the point in time in the system uh, when it was um, tough on crime uh, was the sort of the, the, the mantra or the expectation uh, within the criminal justice system. Uh, in the late 1990s, I was the chief prosecutor for the city of Columbus. And the city attorney and I decided that we wanted to start a diversion program in the, the municipal court for petty theft offenses. Uh, a, a diversion program existed uh, for felony theft offenses. Uh, and so we thought it didn't make sense that a person could commit a felony, be diverted out of the system and get a dismissal. And yet someone in municipal court that picks up a petty theft would end up with a conviction. Uh, and so one of the things that I needed to do was get some buy-in from the judges on the court. And so I had an opportunity to go around and talk to uh, all of the judges and most of them understood what we were doing. Uh, but one judge in particular um, struck me because he said he would not support it uh, because he saw us just coddling uh, people that were uh, committing crimes. Uh, but that was um, the thought of many judges in the system uh, at that time. Uh, then we moved to 2004, which was the first time that I ran for judge uh, in the Common Pleas Court. Uh, and you know, talking with all of the political uh, um, um, experts uh, that were there to help your campaign, uh, they would tell you that you need to be perceived as being tough on crime. And I kept saying, what does that mean, um, being tough on crime? And no one could give me a good explanation. And I was not willing to uh, accept that. Uh, fortunately, the system has moved from that, uh, even though there are some remnants that still exist, um, but that whole uh, being tough on crime. You know, I say all the time uh, that the vast majority of people that I see in the common pleas court uh, are not criminals, okay? There are people that have committed crimes. Yes, okay, in the common pleas court, uh, we do have people that have committed serious offenses. Yes, we have the murderers, uh, we have rapists, and we have other uh, very serious offenses. Uh, but we deal with a large number of low-level offenders as well. Um, as mentioned um, by uh, Mr. Sweeney, you know, a, a large number of cases that I deal with uh, are based upon traffic stops. I mean, it's just amazing. And that's how a lot of people get into the system. Uh, officers on the street will make a traffic stop and they can come up with uh, a variety of reasons for doing so uh, that can be justified and are justified by law. Um, but they make the traffic stop, they find drugs in the car, whether it's low level of drugs, um, maybe a gun in the car. Um, and that is someone that ultimately appears before me. Now, I think the system, at least during the 14 years that I have been on the bench, uh, has begun to recognize that we need to do things differently. 
uh, than how we had been doing them previously. And, and what I mean by that is that we uh, as judges need to be more problem solvers as opposed to just saying, um, you've been committed, you've been convicted of a crime, uh, I'm sending you to prison, uh, you've been convicted of a crime, I'm just placing you out in the community without giving those persons, one, in the community, any resources to help them uh, move beyond where they're at. Uh, and even with those folks that we are sending to prison, uh, there are times and opportunities that we as judges should be willing to give them uh, to provide them uh, chances for early release. Uh, one of the things that I did campaign on uh, when I was running for judges that I indicated that I was going to visit the prisons if elected, uh, because I told people that if I were sending people to prison that I needed to see where it was that I was sending them. And that I also wanted to see what sort of programs were available for people in prison, because I wanted to be able to tell some people, look, I, yes, I am sending you to prison, but if you get engaged in programming, uh, if you, look at classes that can help you if you stay out of trouble, which is not the easiest thing in the world, uh, your attorney will follow motion for early release. Uh, and if I see that you are doing the sort of things that at least indicate to me that you wanna be back in the community, uh, I would be inclined to an early release from prison. So just because we send someone to the institution doesn't mean that we should just forget them. Um, so I think the court system is trying uh, we have a long way to go, obviously. Uh, but when I say that we are trying, you know, Judge Adrian and, and I, uh, through the Supreme Court, uh, uh, every year teach new judges uh, things such as procedural fairness, uh, as well as uh, implicit bias, uh, helping them hopefully to recognize uh, that the, the decisions that they make uh, each and every day uh, should be the best sort of decision that they can be that can be made on the information that's provided to them, not because of the colors of the skin of the person that comes in front of them, not because of the social status of the person that comes in front of them, uh, but at least trying to get judges to think about um, how they go about making these decisions. Uh, the decisions that we make are supposed to be made um, using uh, risk assessment to determine whether someone poses a risk to the community. Uh, and a vast majority of the people, um, the, what they need more than anything uh, are the tools to be successful, whether that's education, whether that's drug treatment, um, whether that's we do a, a lot of cognitive behavior training uh, through our probation department, which is trying to help people understand why they're making the decisions that they're making. Uh, and so I do believe that the system, uh, while we still have a long way to go, uh, is at least recognizing that we need to be uh, more proactive in working with the individuals that are coming through the system uh, and not just, um, again, um, sending them back out in the community without tools or resources to at least have a chance uh, to stay out of the system uh, and not uh, recidivate. Um, there's other things that I, that I can talk about. Uh, hopefully, if we get to the, uh, the question part, but uh, the other two things that were mentioned just real quickly, and if I have time later, um, I will get into a little bit more detail. Uh, but I think other ways that the system has recognized that we need to look at ourselves uh, is the grand jury task force that uh, I chaired um, previously, uh, as well as when we were looking at the, the death penalty in Ohio. Uh, unfortunately, we could not debate whether we needed the death penalty in Ohio. We all looked at ways to hopefully improve it. And I'll give some more detail about that. But um, because of time, uh, I'm going to stop. Thank you very much, Judge McIntosh. Our final panel member is ACRA Municipal Judge David Hamilton, who will focus on an alternative court program called Compass. And he's accompanied tonight by the man running that program, Mike Brown. The judge created the program for young men at high risk to reoffend. Judge Hamilton is an Akron native who was a prosecutor and judicial attorney for Akron Municipal Court and a Summit County Council member, where as chair of the Public Safety Committee, he spearheaded the Summit County Jail Advisory Commission. He's in his first term on the municipal, municipal bench. 
He was a board member of the Victims Assistance Program and currently serves on the boards of Access Point Community Health Centers, the Summit County Land Bank, and First Tee of Greater Akron. Judge Hamilton. Good evening, all. Uh, thank you so much for having uh, myself and uh, Officer Brown here. Uh, so I'll just get right on the compass. Uh, I am a municipal court judge. And so what that means is to kind of piggyback off what everyone else uh, has said is that I do everything municipal. So uh, I handle all uh, domestic violence cases, all the way from misdemeanor, first, first degree misdemeanor domestic violence cases, all the way down to uh, disorderly conducts or even minor misdemeanor cases like uh, marijuana cases. And uh, a lot of my docket is uh, OVI cases as well. Uh, however, with Compass, uh, when I was on the Summit County, so I was a Summit County Councilman, and in 2017, uh, there was a young man who died in the Summit County Jail. And uh, I spearheaded a committee called the Summit County Jail Advisory Committee. And what I, uh, we did a lot of research, and we did a lot of research on the jail. And one of the numbers that really stuck out to me was the fact that uh, black males only make up 7% of the general population here in Summit County. Just 7% of the population here, but they make up over 40% of the population in the Summit County Jail right now. So you've got 7% versus 40%. That is a huge disparity. But we're not even talking about the amount of young men in the criminal justice system. We're just talking about at the Summit County Jail. Uh, so with those statistics that I kept that in mind uh, and I had experience as a prosecutor. So before I was a county council person, I was a prosecutor for the city of Akron, uh, actually in municipal court. And one thing I recognized as a prosecutor that led into my uh, being a councilman and also uh, now as a judge is the fact that uh, we have programs for every other uh, demographic uh, in our county. We've got programs for uh, victims of sex trafficking who committed crimes and it's a diversionary program. We've got a diversionary program for uh, people who, uh, we've got family intervention court. Uh, we've got, you know, veterans court. We've got all these courts and they're great and they, they do a great thing for, for the segment of our population. But uh, we don't have a court for the majority of people that we see day in and day out. And our uh, jail or in our criminal justice system. And that is, is for, young, it, for young black males. Uh, so I started uh, the COMPASS program, which stands for Compassion, Opportunity, uh, Mentoring, Purpose, Assistance, Survival, and Stepping Forward. Uh, and basically it's a program and it's not just for young black males, but it, it's for all males ages 18 to 26. However, uh, the program does address a lot of the issues that young black men face. And, that's, and, and, and that was the, the, one of the main purposes of the program is because again, I want to provide wraparound services for, for young black males who are at a risk for, uh, of reoffending. Uh, because again, the purpose of Compass is to give uh, young men an opportunity or a second chance uh, and to really help them find their way. Uh, so uh, I always tell people it's a play on words. Compass stands for, you know, it has letters that stand for, you know, compassion, opportunity, and mentoring, but it's also like a compass, right? So you help young men find their way. So it's like a double entendre. Uh, but anyway, um, so it is, and, and what it does, it provides young men an opportunity to find their way by uh, giving them opportunities for, you know, job employment. Um, you know, uh, counseling, trauma therapy, because a lot of uh, young black males, they deal with trauma uh, that and research shows that they, they deal with trauma from an early age that manifests as they get older and it, it leads to them committing uh, crimes or even reoffending. So we, we create a program where they're able to, you know, uh, we're able to work with them and, and address these barriers where they can get in a compass and they can we can deal with uh, the issues that they have with finding a job, you know, finding a decent job, making a fair living, a livable wage, you know, giving them opportunities to to get, to be involved in uh, or learn a trade like, you know, HVAC or uh, masonry or carpentry, uh, where they can make uh, a, a nice living, sustainable living for their family. Uh, also, again. Get trauma, you know, therapy through minority behavioral health, 
Uh, we, they're also, they can also be involved in financial literacy classes uh, where we've partnered with the uh, city of Akron as well as the United Way to uh, help them with financial literacy. Um, also, they get par paired with a mentor. So as soon as they get into the program, uh, they will be, they're paired with, uh, we're working with a hundred black men where they'll get a mentor. Because what happens is what we see is that with a, young, a lot of young men, uh, they, once they finish probation, which I've seen with other programs, once they finish probation, they're back out into the communities where they were from before. They're still hanging with the same crowd that they were before. They don't really have a positive role models. So they are always at a high risk of reoffending. So what, what makes Compass different than uh, any other core program is that we keep them plugged in to these resources, even after completion of the program. So they can still stay plugged in with their mentor. They can still stay plugged in with their job coach, with their financial literacy coach. Uh, we wanna keep them plugged into these, to the system so that, into Compass so that if they do lose track, they can always find their way back. Uh, and so again, the ultimate goal is to keep these young men from reoffending and for and to keep them from going any further into the criminal justice system. Because what happens is, uh, you know, we're a municipal court, so we don't typically see you know a lot of high level or career offenders. We see a lot of first time offenders. But with with Compass, what we want to do is stop them from going any further into the system. Because once they go next door to the court of common pleas they've committed a felony. And now at that point, they've done something to materially alter their lives to their detriment. So with Compass, we want to stop them in their tracks and really help them turn their lives around. Uh, so that's pretty much the, essentially, that's pretty much what Compass is in a nutshell. And again, it's just to create opportunities and resources for uh, a lot of these men uh, who don't have these resources. And it, it, it's a way that if you give, if you help someone find a, a, a you know a good job, if you help someone you know get their education or get their GED or get their license, they will be at they will be less likely to reoffend. So really, Compass is about providing resources and information to these young men so that they can lead successful lives. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Hamilton, and to all of our panel members for your insights. Um, we're now down to about fifteen minutes for Q and A and. Thanks to all of you, we have many more questions than we have time for, but we'll get to as many as we can. Um, Judge Adrian, I, the first question goes to you. Um, somebody was, a member of the audience was struck by the points you made and the trouble you had with the system as it is, and is asking what you as a black judge were able to do to reduce the inequities that you mentioned. Or are the procedures so ingrained that an individual, even a judge, can't really change things? Well, it's amazing uh, the uh, power that comes with getting this new name in front of your name, you know, uh, judge, and what you can do with it. It's always uh, been uh, just striking to me how many people sit back and don't really recognize th that they really do have an opportunity to make uh, massive change if they are of a mind to do so. With regard to me, just to use a quick example, uh, I went to Washington, D.C. at the end of 2016 to a convening that they had on fines, fees, and bails. The thing that struck me most of uh, all of the things that I saw over that two-day conference was the amount of damage that could be done to a person's life in as little as three days through this cumulative disadvantage process that we talked about and, and how so many people's lives were destroyed. I thought about it and I thought about the fact that uh, over in 34 years or so that I've been on the bench at that time, that I had given little or no thought to that as a construct. Once I knew that that was what ha happened and what I had been doing, I made up my mind to change it. I came back I drafted a new bail schedule for our court. I convinced the other judges of the court that for minor uh, people charged with low level offenses, uh, uh, where there was no violence, that there was no need to keep them in jail. And inside of uh, two months, we changed that schedule so that uh, people who fell into that category were no longer required to post monetary bail. 
we cut our jail population, our, our workhouse population from 167 uh, to 100 in less than a year. That's daily population. And before I left, we cut it from uh, 100 down to 67. So uh, there's no such thing as uh, one person can't make a difference. One person absolutely positively can as Judge Hamilton is showing with the program that he's doing and as uh, Judge McIntosh has shown with what uh, he's accomplished in, in his jurisdiction. You can make a difference uh, when you are, you're in a position of authority and it is one of the reasons why uh, I have pushed for diversity on the bench because you need different points of view and different uh, ex experiences and understandings in order to make the difference, especially when the majority of the people who are coming in front of you look like you. This, this next question is kind of a composite of multiple questions, um, but I'll put it to you first, Mr. Sweeney. You mentioned the need to gather data to document. And of course, there's the adage that you can't fix what you can't measure. Um, what is getting in the way of being able to collect the data to show what works in the court system and what is detrimental? given that courts run on paper and have documents, public records all over the place? Well, I think, and, and perhaps some of the judges could answer this more easily, but I think one of the challenges, as I understand it, is the, that the different court systems have their own databases. They have their own entries. They, and, and they don't necessarily talk to each other effectively. You know? And so in states that have done this successfully, there has been uniform sentencing entries, uniform uh, databases. And so I think part of it could be, it hasn't been on people's radar. And, and now I think people are pushing for it a little bit more, uh, particularly uh, Chief Justice O'Connor and, and Justice Donnelly. Um, but I think there's some IT technical so problems that uh, kind of stand in, in, in the way. So, Can I speak to that just really quickly? You know, I had uh, the honor of chairing the Ohio Commission on Racial Fairness. We identified this problem in our final report in 1999 <laughs> and indicated that this was something that needed to be done because if you don't have the data, you don't know where you've been, you don't know where you are, there's no way for you to figure out a way forward. It wasn't until Chief Justice O'Connor picked it up this past year that anybody had done anything with that. And I'm hopeful that she's gonna be able to carry it across the finish line before she leaves office. Um, I guess as the prosecutor in the room, Ms. Niemer, this is for you. Uh, and again, a kind of a hybrid of questions. Um, the ham sandwich analogy is here. If a prosecutor wants somebody to be indicted, they'll get it. Uh, and related to that is the question of what is the prosecutor's job and how does the prosecutor do that job to ensure that a grand jury really is an independent body. So the one thing we always have to remember as prosecutors and as a community is the prosecutors have an ethical obligation to make sure that justice is served. And by that, I mean, we are the only ones in the courthouse that have the obligation to make sure that whatever evidence we have, we provide to the defendant, that all that, all that in this case is given and making sure that um, all sides have the ability to represent themselves. So that being said, with the grand jury, um, when we get a case, we can't know what had happened. And, and I think we've all touched on this when a police officer made that stop. We don't know what biases were in their head, what they were thinking, but what we could see is what's on paper. And we have the ethical obligation to make sure that what we present you know, if it has no evidence of a felony that we don't present that to the grand jury. And that's where that, that, that positioning of the, the prosecutor has that power to make sure that something that has zero evidence doesn't go before them, but everything else is up to them to choose. It's not up to us to choose if that should move forward, if that case should move forward. And, and when it comes to the grand jury, they're, they're picked by random selection of like voter registry by the court of common pleas. So um, it's, it's these individuals who serve for a few months at a time and during COVID a little bit longer than that. Um, and they put their time in and they're, they're randomly selected by their voter registration. So 
it's it's they are the gatekeepers of that case moving forward or not. And yes, we do have the ability to not present a case, but we also have the ethical obligation to make sure that if if there was a crime committed that that in its its felony level that it gets presented because if it has no shred of any evidence and it's a misdemeanor, well, that should go to the, mus the municipal court. Um, and then if there's any question, you give it to the grand jury and let them to dis decide um, because that, that's for them to choose. And, and there's so many times I could say that, you know, we'll present a case thinking for sure this is going to get indicted and the grand jury doesn't indict. And then there's a case where like, well, I don't know, we're not sure about this one. And they they do indict so that it's it's in the hands of our voters it's in the hands of the end our citizens to make sure um, that they take these jobs seriously and they volunteer their time when they're chosen um, to be grand jurors or jury members I, I and i'll back to back a question to you from the audience regarding a, a washington post article yesterday uh, an expose of the mishandling of alexis martin's case as a black sex trafficked 15 year old prosecutor for murder in Akron. Has anything happened since then to address the issues in, about the system raised in the article? Well, we did, we have done, I will start by saying our position stands with Ms. Martin that, that she did commit a crime, that she did orchestrate um, that trafficking. Um, but what I will say after that is there has been a lot of, of training, you know, the safe harbor training in the juvenile court and the, in the common police court that, that we initiated in addition to that, um, when, when this incident occurred to make sure that our prosecutors understand what is trafficking. We actually also have um, recently a specialized prosecutor who handles only trafficking cases. Um, we're very much involved with the service providers who, um, who help victims of trafficking. Um, in Ms. Martin's case, we don't think that that is her, her position and will remain on that stance. But um, for other individuals who are victims of trafficking, um, we are trained and we are ready to help those victims. Um, and we have um, the ability to do so, not just by our training or our specialized docket, but by the fact that we, we work with the service providers who are providing the aid to these victims. Uh, Judge Hamilton, as the newest member of the bench, um, I'm going to put this, this one to you. Um, given the historical context provided by Professor Lee, why is there still such an aversion to radically change, dare I say, eradicate the criminal legal system as we know it and reimagine it's something that works for all of us, Black men included? Oh my goodness, that sounds <laughs> tough. Are you sure you want to give that to me? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, well, I would say because of what, you know, we've seen with, uh, you know, you know, Trayvon Martin, all the way from Trayvon Martin to, you know, George Floyd, I think people just, you know, do not trust and, and, and primarily, you know, people that look like me do not trust the criminal justice system. Uh, they don't trust anything about it. They don't like anything about it all the way from the, from the prosecutor to the police officer, uh, even to the judge. I mean, even with the uh, George uh, Floyd uh, case, even though he was found guilty, the first thing I, you know, I would talk to people about, primarily my friends, uh, they would say, well, I, you know, he's guilty, but he's probably not going to get, you know, he's not going to, the, 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 the time is not going to fit the crime. So, I mean, you just, there, there's just a level of mistrust when it comes to the criminal justice system because of, you know, what, you know, we've seen and how we've seen these cases play out through, you know, through the years. Uh, and like, you know, uh, Professor Lee said, you know, from the very beginning, we as, you know, black people, we have, we were, you know, we were property. We were, you know, then the, then the, the criminal justice system allowed it or made it okay or made it legal, you know, even from the constitutional standpoint, uh, made it legal for slavery or made it legal for, or made it easier uh, for uh, people of color to be lynched. So, I mean, it goes back, I mean, this is a historic, um, these historic events lead to today. But I think as a shameless plug for Compass, right? Um, I think that it takes more people and like a, ju a Judge Adrian said, diversity on the bench matters. It's, it's very, very important because you're not just talking about diversity and physical countenance, but you're thinking, you're talking about diversity and thought. And the reason why I was able to even come up with an idea about Compass was because of the neighborhood I came from. 
the fact that I was at, you know, at, at few, a few points, you know, I was, uh, you know, targeted, you know, I was racially profiled. Uh, so, you know, all of these things that I created uh, for the betterment of our community, and I mean, our entire community, were based, based off my experiences, what I know, my experience as a young black male, and being pulled over, being racially profiled, uh, you know, so based on the color of my skin, strictly. Uh, so I think that all these things will lead to a better trust of the criminal justice system. Uh, and, and I'll just say briefly that, you know, when I became a judge, one of the first things I saw uh, when I was in arraignment court were that the, the young black men, they would plead, when they saw me, they would plead guilty. You know, they wouldn't even wait to even talk to their attorney. They would, they came to me and said, look, we're gonna plead guilty because, you know, we, we trust you. So they rather skip the line. They rather, you know, talk to, instead of talking to their attorney or, or even the prosecutor, they come to me and just say, we're gonna plead guilty because in their mind, they saw a white prosecutor, a white officer, and a white public defender, but they saw me as a black judge who looked like them. And so they rather take their chances with me because they felt like they'd had the opportunity to be treated fair. And so diversity on the bench really matters. It matters to our community. And this is the way, you know, we we start, we get people to start to trust the system and trust in the process. And Mel, let me add one more thing there too. Again, the Ohio Commission on Racial Fairness back in 1999, when its primary, one of its primary findings was there was this huge chasm in the way that the criminal justice system was viewed by people of color as opposed to people who were part of the majority community. People of color distrusted the system, thought that the system was not there to help them. They saw the police as warriors rather than guardians. On the other hand, white people thought that the system was working just fine, that there was nothing wrong with the system and that the police were their friends. That has not changed over 20 plus years, 30 plus years. I want to Judge Matt. Back on, uh, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but being in law enforcement, I was a cop for 35 years. And I think one of the things that we're talking about people going initially into the system, there needs to be a concerted effort to make your police departments more accountable, but also more diverse. Uh, the area I worked when I came out of college was primarily uh, one of the areas I grew up in as a kid. And I went, you know, I grew up in one area, but my parents always made sure that I didn't forget where I came from. And so when I came out the academy, I was assigned to work what they call the worst area of the city. To me, it was like going to work and seeing guys I grew up with, uh, some elderly people that steered me in the right direction, people that I knew, that I knew from my grandparents or I knew going to church or I knew through relatives and friends. And even though I knew those people, I didn't perceive them as a threat all the time, where some of my colleagues did. To me, they were just people like me. I didn't perceive them as a threat. And I think one of the biggest problems you have now is when I came out, I was trained primarily by guys, white or black, but had been exposed to diverse cultures. A lot of these guys have been in the military. They had been in the Vietnam War. The suburbs were, weren't what they are now. A lot of these guys that went to diverse schools in the city one of the biggest problems you have now is you got people coming from areas that haven't been around diversity and they're coming into a, an area where they're believing a lot of preconceived notions or stereotypes. And then that's, that's when a lot of these problems occur. Uh, Judge McIntosh, um, I, I'm moving on to some of the diversionary programs that are in place now, and some of the same questions have been applied to them, that they are perceived as working better, at least, for people, for white people, for than, than for people of color. Like many other aspects of the court system, the diversion programs are used most by those with the most resources. Can you address that? Well... Um, for anyone to anyone that has a specialized docket in Ohio and they are certified by the Supreme Court, uh, we must provide 
um, data to the Supreme Court that the people accessing our program reflects our community. So I know that we do that uh, with our drug court in Franklin County. Uh, and I don't, and I believe if we didn't do that, uh, the point that you're making would absolutely be true. And I think one of the reasons that they insist upon that uh, is the uh, fact that uh, many people of color were not given access uh, to the various diversion programs. Uh, again, I hope that's changing uh, because in many situations, it is a, prosecutor, a prosecutorial decision to agree as to who gets access into the, the various uh, types of programs. Um, but the fact that courts are uh, looking at alternative ways uh, to deal with the variety of issues you know, as Judge Hamilton talked about uh, the different types of drug courts, and we have a variety of drug courts in Franklin County as well, uh, provides much more hands-on and one-on-one -on -one, uh, is the reason why they tend to be a little bit more successful um, because we're looking at ways to hopefully change people um, uh, to um, do things differently than what they've done previously. Okay, thank you. And thanks to all of you. I'm looking at a dozen other questions on my text messages here, as well as the whole group that the panel came up with before this evening even started. Uh, but I think we've touched on some really important issues. Uh, there is an answer to one more question that we have, and that is for the audience. What can you do? And the person providing us with the answer is Liz King. She's the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Director for the uh, Akron League of Women Voters. And she's somewhere in the room. Sorry, I was muted there. Um, thank you, ML. It's been quite an evening and I hope you all feel that way. You've learned important areas of our criminal justice system and significant, the significant negative impacts on people of color and the poor who enter this system. These disparities include, as you've heard, the inequitable cash bail system. I won't go into statistics because you've heard them earlier of how dire the circumstances are for those who are incarcerated and held in jail before their trials. So now you can take action. Um, you can support House Bill 315, Senate Bill 182 on bail reform, mentioned earlier by Mr. Sweeney. A link is going into the chat box right now. Please don't go on your screen and click because nothing will happen. <laughs> but it's in the chat box and you can click on that and it will take you to your legislator, uh, your legislators, both in the House and the Senate with a message urging them to support these two bills. You can make a difference. Our second take action highlights a major problem in the election of judges in our state. Three, in five individuals say they don't know enough about judges and the courts to vote. As um, mentioned tonight, we also, we want judges who reflect our communities. So Chief Justice O'Connor has spearheaded efforts uh, to provide better educational programs on the courts and the selection of judges. JudicialVotesCount.org is a, um, a combined effort of the Chief Justice. She's brought in a number of organizations, including the League of Women Voters of Ohio, uh, the Bliss Institute at Akron U, um, and a number of other organizations. And this site provides comprehensive information you need to make informed choices on judicial candidates. Most of us will greatly appreciate this information. There's a link in the chat again. Go in the chat, you'll find a link that will take you to the site. There will be additional updated information on candidates uh, in the um, uh, coming election. But right now you'll get an idea of what the site is about and 
gain some valuable information. We wanna thank our important partners who you see on the screen for their invaluable assistance and support. The leagues of Greater Akron, of Greater Cleveland, of Hudson, of Kent um, produce the Real Talk series. And we welcome your participation and your interest. We accomplish more as new members join us. So please, you're also going to find in that wonderful chat room, more links to each league and what we provide. Our partners links are also included in the chat. You will be receiving an email with link, links to the recording, the slides, the comprehensive resources about tonight's topics. Thank you for joining us, but I particularly wanna say special thanks to our wonderful moderator, ML Schultze, and to our distinguished and committed panel members. Schultze, you have the last word. Thanks, Liz. And thanks again to all of you for joining us for the first of these two sessions examining Ohio's courts through the lens of racial equity. We'll pick up next Wednesday at 7 p.m. with a closer look at reentry and the consequences that follow people long after sentencing. Your moderator will be Faluke Ormason, a reporter with WKSU. Also, just a reminder, everyone will be emailed the recording of tonight's session, the list of resources, and all of this material will also be uploaded to the Real Talk website at realtalklwv.org. Good night to everyone, and again, thanks.